Hi, I'm Dr. John Chow. I have the very rare privilege of having two people in my practice who are professors in the respective universities, Cal State LA and UCLA, and their uh, area of expertise in Chicano studies, Mexican American studies, and they have both written books that shed light on the Mexican American movement and the history of that movement. So I have arranged for both professors to be here. And so uh, before uh, we do anything else, I would want to introduce uh, Professor Robert Chow Romero from UCLA, tenure professor in the um, Mexican American Studies, Chicano mm -hmm. Studies of UCLA and Professor Negretti, who has been a patient of mine for many, many years. And he's a he's professor, a tenure professor from Cal State LA, where I also attended before I went to dental school at USC. And so, uh, Professor Romero, would you tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote? And uh, give us a little summary of what you did, and maybe we'll ask you some questions on it. Certainly, sure, for sure. Well, it's a privilege to be here to talk about my book. Um, the book is called The Chinese in Mexico, and it is really a, kind of a study of myself, so to speak. Um, my father um, was, was an immigrant, is an immigrant from Chihuahua, Mexico, and my mother an immigrant from Hubei in central China. And this book sort of tells us the history of the Chinese community in Mexico, unknown to most people, um, about a hundred years ago, the Chinese were the second largest immigrant ethnic group in all of Mexico. Uh, we were present in basically every state in Mexico. And we, we made our way to Mexico because of, unfortunately, because of, of the anti-Chinese laws in the United States. And so in 1882, um, the Chinese community um, was banned from the United States. And, and, and that ban basically lasted more or less with certain exceptions until about 1965. And so after being excluded from the US, many Chinese immigrants went to Mexico as a way of looking for economic opportunity and also as a way of um, entering the US. And so unknown to many people, the Chinese, the Chinese invented undocumented immigration. The Chinese were actually the first um, undocumented immigrants from Mexico. So all the processes of, of undocumented immigration in terms of smuggling on the border, fake papers, all those things invented by my people. Um, in terms of just one more thing, so many Chinese also went to Mexico a hundred years ago because of economic opportunities, especially in northern Mexico there were many um, opportunities for to, to be successful in commerce because of, of sort of the development of urban centers in places like Sonora and Chihuahua, Mexico. And so many went and, and became um, small-scale merchants. And very sadly, one of the things that happened was that um, Mexican revolutionary uh, patriotism coincided with anti-Chinese uh, sentiment and laws and movements. And the Chinese were actually um, expelled from uh, Mexico in 1931. The entire, the entire Mexico nation or just certain states? So the expulsion was specifically from the state of Sonora but the anti-Chinese movement itself, it was sadly, very sadly, throughout Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that extreme vitriol against the Chinese community in Sonora, it had a ripple effect. Mm, um, I see. It had a ripple effect. But they were kind of victims of their own success, wasn't it? That was a lot of, a lot of it because um, <laughs> many Chinese became successful um, merchants, small-scale merchants, right. and developed a monopoly on small-scale trade, especially in northern Mexico. And so... You had um, aspiring middle-class Mexican merchants who were jealous, and, and, and that was a lot of, of, unfortunately, a lot of what spurred the, the anti-Chinese movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Professor, do we have any questions for Professor Romero? Well, is that still going on now, the anti-Chinese uh, racism? So um, my, my, my experience and observation from scholars who have brought the research more up to date. Like my study ends in 1940, um, more of a historical study. Um, there is some anti-Chinese sentiment, I think, in Mexico, but it, it's not strong. It's mm -hmm. not strong. 
anymore. Um, I think largely because the Chinese presence is much more limited. It's significant. There's probably maybe 5,000 people or so, but, but I think that it's not that prominent enough to, to kind of stir that type of, of backlash. Are you saying that only 5,000 Chinese are in Mexico? Yes, more or less. That's like, amazing. Now? No. Only mm -hmm. 5,000? You know, the numbers could have shifted over the years. I thought there were about 5,000 Chinese restaurants over there. <laughs> That's funny. I just ate in one, I just ate in one of them a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the the the, the uh, area of Mexicali, that yeah. borders Calexico, it's still famous for its Chinese food, and you have uh, New York Times articles, and I've been interviewed for like NPR stories about that food, which is pretty fun if you want to look into that. But um, but it is a relatively small number. It might be more than five thousand, yeah. but not much more actually, not much That's more. Amazing. Yeah. Now both of you are in academia. Do you think? The Asians, not necessarily the Chinese, the Asians are again the victims of their success because now there is complaints by some Asian students that because they do so well, they're actually not getting their share of admission into the Ivy League schools mm. or the high, high end schools. So I'd love to hear from Professor Negrete, and I'm happy to respond as well. How's the, how's the question relating to uh, the Mexican-American relationships with other minority groups in California? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be too much racism against Chinese among the Mexicans in California. At least you never hear about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah. But uh, I understand from reading your book that uh, this was a very severe, extensive problem in Mexico, mm -hmm. especially because of the uh, uh, the anti-Chinese legislations and prohibitions against immigration in the United States that made it very difficult for Chinese to come into this country. But eventually, some most of them did. And I'm glad to see they're here. They're adding <laughs> a big dimension to the yeah. cultural, historical development of uh, America as a bi-nation, bicultural nation, or a multi multicultural nation with multi languages spoken in this country. And it's made America great, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I'm very fortunate to be able to come to America when I was only. 14 years old, and uh, that was uh, that was before the open door policy it became effect, mm -hmm. came to effect in uh, in the 60s. So the fact that uh, our family was able to move here, and that was quite a phenomenal uh, accomplishment uh, by my by my father. I mean, I'm glad and and come to America and be able to avail myself of the opportunities that America offers uh, someone who's willing to work hard and uh, show, uh, show um, the spirit of um, um, uh, adventure and spirit of innovation. So I'm very glad to be here. And I, I think, do you not think that it is uh, that uh, no, one, no one is more appreciative of American culture than immigrants? Oh. Absolutely. And I think it'd be wonderful if uh, immigrants from China and from Mexico and the United States would get together and work together to make this mm -hmm. a stronger country. I, yes. the, the thing that impresses me about American history is how immigrants have come to this country and have, and have helped the country to succeed both in international relationships with other countries of the world and with international relationships among the immigrants from many different countries to the United States. But I, I can see a uh, possibility, uh, hopefully, for people from China and people from the U Mexico that get together in America to form a stronger alliance for justice for all minority groups in this country. Mm -hmm. And we have the example in your family. Yes. <laughs> a good mixture, <laughs> nice yeah. mixture of Mexican-American and, and Chinese cultures. I think so. <laughs> yeah, a good example of that. 
and, and I think that um, kind of one historical lesson there is that um, unfortunately in oftentimes or sometimes in U.S. history like different ethnic groups get um, kind of pitted against one another yes and so a hundred years ago it was as, as as our Chinese ancestors were excluded um, groups like Italians and Irish actually were also being excluded but but we were often pitted against one another. Mm -hmm. um, the newer immigrants pitted against the older immigrants. And the same thing today, oftentimes, where um, as Asian Americans, we can sometimes be portrayed, positioned as a wedge as a wedge group, even though we have this, for example, the same history of, of exclusion. And so, in, so I, I hope that those lessons from history can bring us together and make us stronger, yeah. um, because it's all of our history. Yeah, that's a, that's a good start. So, Professor, Ready? would you tell us a little bit about your book? Well, uh, my book... On, uh, on Chicano Homeland. Oh, the yes. movement in East L.A. for Mexican-American power, justice, and equality. Well, I, I was very much impressed by the involvement of the younger generation in the 1960s and 70s and 80s to fight for justice for Mexican-American immigrants and citizens in the United States. Um, so I just thought I would write the book to inform the younger generations that are still coming ahead of how their predecessors helped eliminate much of the discrimination that existed against Mexican Americans in Los Angeles. Although the discrimination against Mexican Americans in Los Angeles continues, but it's in, in forms that are difficult to articulate for some people. The majority of the poor people in L.A. are Hispanic, and uh, that poverty can damage the community as much as politicians and elected officials praise the work of the community staying together. They praise the minority groups, but they don't do much to help them. Mm -hmm. So this book is, a, is goes through into the history of, um, of a Ch Chicano movement being born in East LA, and then uh, and your and your giving the history of it would point the way to further uh, continue the, the movement in terms of obtaining fairness and justice. Yes, on the, <clears throat> the um, there's a great opportunity today for the Chicano movement to revive to continue to articulate enough involvement in politics to ensure that elected officials and government officials respond to the problems that affect all minority groups in Los Angeles, particularly for the Hispanic-speaking groups. I am glad to see the movement has re resulted in achievements and to the extent that Mexican-American Immigrants are now found working for the police department, for the hospitals, for businesses, for corporations, for nonprofits, to bring some progress to this country, which I think is we can be grateful. But we can't allow the uh, over racism to continue or, or to come back against Mexican Americans. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor, you are uh, actually a trailblazer in terms of the Chicano movement. And uh, you, you spoke of your first experience with students um, protesting for better education mm -hmm. from the local high school. Would you tell us a little bit about how, how that happened, that inspired you to spend your, your next 30 or so years in, uh, in the Chicano movement as a professor? Well, um, there was so much clamor for justice for Mexican-Americans, for the inclusion of Mexican-Americans as professors at the universities and at the uh, high schools. And uh, when students, when I saw students running away from the high school in East L.A., I uh, stopped my car to see what was going on, and I noticed that the police were there calling the students to come back to the school. The students refused to, refused to come back unless their demands were met. 
for improvement in the education of Mexican-American students in East LA. They wanted Spanish-speaking teachers. They wanted coverage of the history of the Mexican-Americans in this country in their classes. And uh, since they weren't getting that treatment, they walked out of school with, with signs that called, we want better education. And they demanded that the school district respond to the educational needs of the Mexican-American students. And I think they succeeded at that. Yes, so they the definitely have. Yeah. Yeah. It's, common, it's common now for high schools to have that kind of uh, better education, uh, uh, Spanish-American history, and so on. And you were one of the earliest mm -hmm. uh, activists, weren't you? You you were the one that start, founded or co-founded the uh, the Mexican American Studies at Cal State LA, weren't you? Yeah. And yeah. that was one of the first programs in the in, in the country. It was the Department of Chicano Studies, which was brought about in response to demands from Chicano students at Cal State LA and throughout the southern Los Angeles region. And now we have departments of Chicano studies all across this country, mm -hmm. which uh, I think will invite students to be more concerned about how the laws and uh, discrimination affect different minority communities. Mm -hmm. And so that the Mexican-American community still has a great potential to be part of the civil rights movement in the United States that involves all minority groups. Mm -hmm. And we have a great deal to be thankful for that you were in the forefront mm -hmm. of uh, and instigated uh, this uh, and were part of the, uh, the genesis of this movement. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the founders and trailblazers. places. We want to thank you for that, Professor McGrath. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.